when we think of labour and birth, we think of it as like a physical event. And absolutely it is. Obviously, there's physical changes that are happening and the physiology of birth is very much physical. However, birth is, and I sometimes say, and this isn't a you know scientific number, but I sometimes say birth is actually like 80% psychological um, and okay. mental. And that's because our minds and bodies are so powerfully connected. So if we're of a mindset that actually this birth is going to be really painful and really scary and really traumatic because that's what we are told. And we're rolling. Welcome to the Parenting Truths podcast. Today I'm joined by midwife, sister, podcaster and most importantly, mother Pip Davis. Thanks for joining me, Pip. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to come on. I love a good chat. (laughs) <laughs> so I really wanted to chat today because you provide so much support to parents. I think over on Instagram alone, you've posted almost 2000 times. You've got a podcast with well over 100 episodes. You create courses. You work as a midwife sister. You're a mum. So firstly, where do you find the time to sort of squeeze all of that in? <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. I mean, a bit like you, although I now know having booked a talk with you, Tom, how amazing your calendar system is. And I'm totally getting that in my life because I feel like that's a game changer. (laughs) But the issue is I've got to get myself organized enough to organize a calendar. That's where I'm at. Um, It is is chaos, isn't it? It's absolute chaos juggling it all. But I think when you're juggling things that you are really passionate about, and I am relentlessly passionate about pregnancy, birth, prep, postnatal, parenting, all of those aspects, pelvic health, exercise in that in that system, um, that it, it kind of doesn't feel like work. It's it really is a passion. And I and I genuinely I know sometimes people say that, don't they? You know, love your job and never work a day in your life. But I am relentlessly passionate about it and I see the difference it makes to to women, to dads, birth partners, families. And so to me, that reward is just awesome in terms of the impact at such important times in people's lives. So it makes it all worth it. But yeah, the juggle, the juggle is fun. There's a lot of early mornings. There's a lot of late nights. There's a reason that I have aged significantly um, (laughs) over the last few years, but it's all worth it. And how old's your little one at the moment? He is 22 months. Oh, wow. 22 months which actually I checked this morning because we've just been on holiday and okay. I was telling everyone that he was 20 months and my husband was like, I think he's older than that now. I was like, is he? <laughs> so I confirmed his age. He is, he is exactly 22 months as of yesterday. <laughs> I think when once um, he hits two, you'll start maybe aging him Easier. in half years. So it'll be two, almost two and a half, then three. It becomes a little yeah. bit easier. Then it becomes like, there's too much maths, isn't there? Otherwise, there's too much maths. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so much I want to dive into today. But for context, can we start with your sort of professional background and maybe dive way back and what motivated you when you were a lot younger to get mm. into midwifery? Yeah, of course. So my journey into midwifery was a bit odd and honestly not super inspiring. So I was meant to be a vet. I always wanted to be a vet from when I was tiny. I wanted to be a vet. All of my work experience was veterinary based. Um, And then I took a a year out because I had to have some surgery and met my now husband whose auntie was a midwife. And I was talking to her one day and I kind of in the back of my head was like, oh, do I really want to commit to like seven years of training? and I was kind of doubting my choices at that point and I met her and she was a midwife and I was talking to her and I thought yeah do you know what I think I'll do that and it was literally literally like that (laughs) and I was 18 and so I somehow got into midwifery um onto the degree course with all my experiencing with lambing and veterinary and absolutely nothing really in terms of people it was all very much animal based um and then I saw my first birth as a like 18 year old and was like, what on earth is this? This is horrendous. There's no way. Like, what am I doing here? This is awful. Um, thankfully, was convinced to stick it out a little bit longer, you know, watch a few more. Um, and then, I, you know, a few months in, I realized that absolutely this was the, the best job for me. And I I genuinely do feel like I've got the best job in the world. It's it's, it's always different. I've worked in a variety of settings from kind of community and home birth to birth centres, wards. And um, since since I think 2019 now, I've been a sister on a delivery suite, which 
I really enjoy because I feel like delivery suite sometimes gets a bit of a bad rep. It's a bit right. like, oh, I don't want to go to delivery suite. I don't want to go to labor ward just where, you know, the doctors might force me to have this and that. And it's all very medicalized. And what I really embrace about my position there is how we can support women that do perhaps have some, you know, pregnancy complications or need a bit of extra monitoring, but how we can support those families to have a really positive experience normalizing things as much as safely possible and really empowering them in that way and kind of getting rid of that fear mongering almost that sometimes exists around delivery suites or labor wards so that's that's kind of why I love it um, and actually, excitingly, at the end of next month, I am undertaking a year's secondment to okay. try and develop um, and kind of we're, we're kind of rolling out a pelvic health service for women um, locally and then hopefully prove that that's a really great thing and it's really needed because we know it is um, so that then that will be a kind of a service that will hopefully be scaled nationally so that it's accessible to all women on the NHS because at the moment there's kind of nothing after you've had a baby and it's major injury to your body in pregnancy and during birth and then you kind of get discharged and left and women's bodies are changed and they need rehab and they need support and there isn't a lot out there so really excited to be embracing that alongside still working on labour ward because they just can't get rid of me and I love birth so much so yeah that's kind of I guess a bit of a whistle stop tour as to how I became a midwife and have kind of progressed to where I am now within the within the midwifery service and it's quite um it's one of those roles in life that you have an opportunity to have such a big impact on someone's life like if someone Mm -hmm. um has a positive birthing experience the midwife lives long in their memory doesn't it it's certainly if they're supporting them through um like a really intense labor yeah it's so true Tom and and for that woman, you know, you, you don't forget the, the way you feel. And it's the same, you know, for dads and birth partners in that environment, whoever is there. You don't forget those feelings, those emotions that you have when this baby comes into the world, whether it's your first baby or your 20th. You don't forget that feeling. Um, and so I think it's really important. And, and my ethos is that a positive birth isn't what it looks like. So it's not, you know, a water birth with nice candles and everything's, you know, low risk and beautiful. That's not to me what encompasses a positive birth. To me, it's the way that family, that woman feels at the moment that they welcome their baby into the world, whether that's an emergency cesarean or a forceps or a normal birth at home. It, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's those feelings that we we reap and being able to continue those, which, you know, the the fourth trimester being a new parent is <laughs> a tough old journey. So if we can go into that with positive emotions rather than a negative one, it's a, it's a game changer for so many. Yeah. So we had um, a baby, baby Mia, in December. Um, but unfortunately, our, the birth before that um, in 2021 was when Laura was five months pregnant. So she gave birth mm. to baby Noah, obviously didn't survive. So Mia's pregnancy and the birth was quite traumatic because Laura was under a lot of stress, a lot of worry. But the midwives obviously could see what we'd been through. Laura's been pregnant seven times we've got two oh, little ones God. um but the midwives were absolutely unbelievable throughout the whole um pregnancy because Laura had to be induced um she was monitored daily for the month leading up to the birth um two months leading up to the birth actually and yeah there's a couple of the midwives that um during the induction sort of checked off their shift and then a few days later just after Mia was born one of the midwives came in extra early just so she could sit with Laura I think she sat with her for about 30 to minutes to an hour and just spoke to her gave her her time and she certainly lived long in Laura's memory and she, she always talks about I think it was Cam um what a positive impact she had on the whole sort of what was quite a traumatic lead up to birth yeah. Oh, what a, what a journey that you guys have had to bring your babies into the world. I know. And, and like you say, it it makes such a big impact. And and I suppose I had I had my little boy in September 2021. And as much as I always understood how much of an impact I could have as a midwife, I don't think I truly felt that 
until I experienced it on on the other side. And I was yeah. like, wow, the way they made me feel was, you know, that could have been so different. Um, and and I guess that really brought home to me, like you were saying, that that real impact that you can have when you're working with people in such a vulnerable time and such an anxiety provoking time. And I think especially for women during the pregnancy, it's a lot of pressure because no one else can look after your baby for you once they're out you can sort of say to your mum or you know your partner what do you think do you think this is all right does this rash look okay to you should we show someone else whereas in pregnancy you're you're the only person and that's a massive pressure and worry and anxiety and then especially if you've had a really difficult journey up to that point like you guys clearly had that just exacerbates that a thousand times and yeah. so it's so important that those people up that are around you are providing that compassionate individualized care that you really really need in that time yeah and have you got any tips for parents because obviously certainly for first-time parents it can be such a daunting prospect couldn't it leading up to the birth and the and the labour. So all we can really do is try and get as best prepared as we can. Have you sort of got any tips for both pe- sets of parents, sort of how they can sort of mentally prepare for the birth as best as they can? Yeah, absolutely. I love that you mentioned mentally there because often I think when we think of labour and birth, we think of it as like a physical event. And absolutely it is. Obviously, there's physical changes that are happening and the physiology of birth is very much physical. However, birth is, and I sometimes say, and this isn't a you know scientific number, but I sometimes say birth is actually like 80% psychological and, and okay. mental. And that's because our minds and bodies are so powerfully connected. So if we think about, I don't know, 3 p.m., we've had a busy day, we're starving, and we start thinking about that that favourite treat of ours, so whether that's that freshly baked carrot cake with really nice whipped cream on it, whatever <laughs> our like favourite thing is, and we start thinking about it, you almost start to feel your mouth salivating because your, your mind is really connected to your body and created a physical change. And the same is true with labour and birth. So if we're of a mindset that actually this birth is going to be really painful and really scary and really traumatic because that's what we are told on, you know, through the media, medium of films and TV. We've seen so much about traumatic, scary birth. So we're now living in this kind of epidemic almost of birth fear and anxiety. And if we've got our minds in that place, then yeah, the reality is when we feel a contraction, that is going to signal to our minds, actually, this is scary, this is fearful, and this is really painful. And we end up in what I term the pain, fear, tension cycle. So the more we're fearful of it, the more tense our body becomes, and therefore the more painful it is. So we fear it even more, we get more tense, it gets more painful, we end up in this rapid cycle. And when we're in this cycle during labour and birth, what happens is we really trigger our body's fight or flight response. So we see surges in hormones like cortisol and adrenaline that send all of our blood to our arms and legs so that we can run away from a threat. So if you're an animal in the wild, you're trying to birth your child, and then there's a threat, that's really handy because you can run away to safety. In the modern day world for human people, that's really unhelpful because what it means is your contractions stop, your labour stalls, more likely need medical intervention and so on. So what we really need to do is prepare our minds throughout the whole of pregnancy. And that's where dads or birth partners become a really valuable resource as well and very much in it together. So being able to understand actually what adaptions, what changes your body and your baby are making throughout all of pregnancy in preparation for birth, because women's bodies are designed for this process. And there is so much that happens that allows your pelvis to become wider, your baby's head to be able to mould and become smaller and those bones overlap so they can fit through your pelvis easier. As we start to kind of understand our body's capabilities, and I always say try and approach birth in a state of calm confidence, but that only comes by being well-educated about all birth. So knowing if I have an induction of labour or a forceps birth or an emergency cesarean or an episiotomy or all of those things that typically aren't the top of people's birth preferences, if I have any of those, I know how I'm going to make informed, empowered decisions, how I'm going to boss that experience, how me and my birth partner are going to work together and how ultimately that is still going to be positive. 
And when we go into it with this really positive, calm, confidence mindset, instead of that negative pain cycle of fear and tension, we can move into more of a physiological cycle where we accept that, yes, there may be some sensations of pain during labor and birth. Some women don't feel any of that but lots of women will report pain during contractions. But the more we can accept and enjoy it, and we can relax into it, the more we release these hormones called endorphins. And we love endorphins because they're natural painkillers. So we suppress that adrenaline and cortisol so that our body's natural endorphins start to rise to help us manage those sensations. And also our oxytocin levels, which is the hormone super powerful in allowing contractions to happen. That starts to rise as well. So as a result, labor tends to progress quicker, more straightforward, with less okay. complications, and women typically experience less pain. But that's where having become educated with a dad or birth partner is really powerful because they also then know the tools and techniques to implement to help mum into that cycle. And often, and you'll appreciate this, Tom, when a woman is laboring, We don't want to be, and often their minds can't kind of think about what music's playing or what the Mm. lights are like because you're head somewhere else. So having that other person that understands the importance of that and can deal with all of that stuff for you is actually invaluable. So birth partners and dads are really important in that in that whole process. And there is there is actually research that shows a good supportive birth partner reduces the risk of things like emergency cesareans or needing more pharmacological pain relief in labor and, and intervention. So it's a it's a really powerful role that sometimes I think we kind of underestimate a little bit. That was a long answer. I should have warned you I like to talk. No, that was great. <laughs> um, and yeah, just generally in life, so say for example, someone was having a panic attack, just that natural calming presence of another human being does reduce that stress response. S- similar to, you know, toddler meltdowns and tantrums and things like that. It really does help. Um, I think two things that really helped Laura and I, um, there's a woman locally that supports parents. Coincidentally, her business is called Little Pips and she um, supports (laughs) um, parents with hypnobirthing and toddler classes, baby classes and things like that. And um, so we did hypnobirthing with her that was fantastic just for, like you say, that awareness, just to know Mm. what to expect um, obviously there was breathing techniques and things in there, but it was more just having her on hand to field those questions and to mentally prepare us for what was coming. And she also shared with us some birth plan cards where we could lay every potential um, sort of thing that could happen during the birth out on the floor. I think there was 20 or 30 cards and slowly but surely we'd work through them. And by the time you'd finished going through the cards, you did, you ended up with your birth plan. And that was brilliant as well because it puts you more in control going into the labor. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really great technique because often a fear of you know women and partners is this feeling of being out of control during birth. And I always like to really challenge that um, because Ultimately, it is a woman's body. So anything that she says no to doesn't happen. Anything she says yes to does happen. And it is literally that simple. So there is no way you cannot be in control. Because if you don't want something to happen and you say no, it doesn't happen. So the control is always within the hands of that woman whose body is going to have something done or not done to it. And I think that's always really powerful for for women to remember. But it's important that we can make informed decisions. So you'll have recommendations, but how do you take that on board? Look at look at kind of the pros and cons individual to you and your family and your baby and your preferences and your pregnancy, because we're all so beautifully unique. And then make an informed choice that's right for, for you. And that's where, again, having a pre-understanding is really helpful. So it's not all kind of brand new information at the time. And then I love using a tool that I'm sure you guys were probably taught during, during that practice is the brain tool, where you can literally whiz through the benefits, the risks, the alternatives, what your intuition's telling you, and what about if you do nothing. And I love that tool because it's great for women to use, but actually if she's having lots of contractions and you know that actually it's not something you'd really talked about or learned much about prenatally, then you can run through or what's the benefits and risks of that and, and work through that as a birth partner, um, which is really useful. 
And I always say that everyone in that room needs to understand what's happening and what the options are. So that's, you know, your obstetrician, your midwife, mum, and also birth partner. You all need to understand because we have seen recently increases in birth trauma amongst birth partners. Um, and I think I think that is not surprising in all honesty, because when there is something that, that happens or there is a traumatic experience, the woman going through it is, is obviously still very traumatic, but she doesn't really see it in the same way that birth partner in the corner of the room that's essentially got a complete bird's eye view of everything that's happening, don't quite see it in the same way. So often for, for dads or birth partners, it's actually more, tra- more of a traumatic experience than it is for the woman going through that. And that's where being on board with all of that kind of pregnancy support and education is really important so that you can also understand the options, the twists and turns, et cetera, that may crop up. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, How did, so obviously when you became a mother, you had all of this experience, all of this firsthand experience. (laughs) So you had quite a unique journey into your own sort of um, birth and labour. How did sort of that play out for you? Obviously, we don't need to go into super loads of detail, but was that quite a unique journey for you, having so much awareness um, going into the labour? Yeah, I suppose it was. And actually, if I go back to the kind of beginning of my pregnancy, um, we became pregnant in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and that was really, really difficult because I was still working frontline as a midwife, seeing COVID positive women, that second wave, we saw a lot of pregnant women with COVID. Mm. So very much in the thick of COVID, you know, everyone was isolating and locked down. And there I was first trimester of pregnancy in the middle of COVID and un- unable to avoid it in my job. Um, and that was really difficult because at that time was when the vaccine wasn't advised for pregnant women. And then it was a bit gray. And I was like, I don't really know what to do. I'm obviously from, from a medical perspective, low risk, but from a exposure perspective, super high risk. And I didn't know what to do. And so that was really difficult. And I, and I really felt for women because women were constantly saying, you know, should, should what's the recommendation? Is it safe? And, and at that point we were literally like, we just don't know. We have no idea. So I really empathized with women that were going through that at that time, because that was really challenging. Um, and really anxiety provoking. Um, and then I suppose if I fast forward to, we then knew it was a safe and great thing to do, which which was so much easier, I think, for everybody in terms of their their decision making. Yeah. Um, my my pregnancy was was pretty straightforward. The first trimester was hideous. I didn't realise how. <laughs> when people say like the first trimester they felt really rough and tired and sick, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah oh my goodness, it was horrendous. I was constantly sick. It was disgusting. Thankfully it got better, but I'm definitely much more empathetic with women that um, experience hyperemesis or severe morning sickness, having experienced that myself. Um, And then as I, as I prepared for birth, I, I felt really confident actually. Um, And I felt really confident in my body's ability to birth my baby, regardless of what happened. And I felt really safe and really held because I knew the team. I I birthed at the hospital I work at, so I knew the team. Oh, wow. And I knew how, yeah, which was, which was, for me, was 100% the right decision. I needed to know who was looking after me um, and to be able to trust them implicitly with me and my baby's life, ultimately. Yeah. Um, So I I felt really excited to birth. There was probably a little bit of lingering anxiety, but it certainly wasn't the, the primary and um, kind of emotion coming through when when I started having contractions I was like yes like this is awesome we're going to do this and I felt I kind of felt that throughout the the thing that I didn't expect was I really thought I would completely switch my midwife hat off I really did because I completely trusted the midwife looking after her. she's a great friend she's an awesome midwife and um, and I really thought I would just be a laboring woman and switch my midwife head off but I just couldn't <laughs> and I was like right you need to examine me now because this should be happening and I, I just couldn't switch my midwife head off um, to the point where actually when our little boy was born she said to me Pip you've managed your entire labour so you might as well just deliver your own baby so then I was in the water <laughs> so managed to deliver him myself as well which was lovely um, but I yeah I was surprised that I couldn't let that that bit go but um, yeah it was really interesting but it definitely made me recognise how important the job is of a midwife and how much of an impact that has I, I did really feel that the importance but it also also highlighted to me, I suppose, postnatally, 
how contrasted that care often is to prenatally and you know our, our postnatal community midwife was was great and it's not a reflection on the professionals it's it's how the system runs in in the UK that you have your antenatal appointments all scheduled and then postnatally it's a bit like off you go <laughs> we might see yeah. once or twice and that's kind of it and um, that really shocked me I was like oh I want to you know I know about pelvic health and I want to rehabilitate and there's no one here to guide me. And actually that led me to creating my own online postnatal recovery course because I just thought, what what is there for women? This is shocking. This isn't good enough. Um, so that that definitely surprised me. But um, the experience on the whole was positive, but I definitely recognised the, the lack of support in terms of I guess, education, because time constraints on appointments, the NHS is so stretched, it's an amazing thing, and we're so blessed to have it, but it is at capacity, and it is stretched, and everyone is running a thousand miles an hour, Um, and I... I was fortunate because obviously I understand pregnancy and and comprehensively, but I thought, actually, for women that don't, this is quite scary. Yeah, I think, um, like you say, there's, like, individually within the NHS, I've got... like just positive experiences mm-hmm. with the majority of people I encounter. But I think, yeah, it's just in terms of whether it's the way it's run and like like you say, the stretch on resources, there's just very limited. It's quite a rare scenario where someone can go through something so traumatic on the body and just literally be sent on their merry way to just get on with it with very minimal support. It's insane, isn't it? Like, if we think about a cesarean section, that's major abdominal surgery. If you had major knee surgery, you would have follow-ups with your like physio. You'd have this whole process, wouldn't you, of, like, rehab. If you have a cesarean, and there's absolutely nothing. Like, that just makes no sense. I don't even understand how that's still a thing in 2023. Um, and, you know, even without cesarean section, your pelvic floor is really damaged during pregnancy mm. and then birth makes that worse. So why aren't we rehabilitating women? It's um, it's a dream of mine, Tom. It's a dream of mine that that changes and that, and that that changes in pregnancy as well so that women are educated prior to that point. So it's not, oops, now I found that when I jump, I leak. Actually, what could we have done prenatally to to help that woman um yeah it's it's a it's a mission (laughs) and and how are you driving that forward because obviously ultimately you want that to be support provided on the nhs is that right yeah i think it needs to be and i think we need to look at pregnancy and birth as an injury to that woman's body and i know that there's loads of work to not treat pregnant women like they're sick and i'm totally on board with that i think pregnancy should be a time when women feel their strongest and their most capable because they've got this this big thing to do so we don't want to make them feel weak and disempowered um, and i'm passionate about women being educated and supported in pregnancy which is why i have my um my kind of flagship flagship course that's called your pregnancy journey so supports women from trimester one right to baby in their arms every step of the way no stone unturned everything in there that you could possibly need but i think as much as we want to empower women we do need to recognize there are physiological and hormonal and significant changes to the body that do ultimately result in weakness and injury And so we need to provide that education. We need to be able to provide individual assessment and then pick women up postnatally, determine what degree of injury we've got. Have we got diastasis recti injury, which is that separation of the abdominal, um, the muscles and the stretching of the linear alba connective tissues. Have we got pelvic floor injury? Have we got some scars? You know, what, what trauma have we got? And then how can we rehabilitate that in the same way we would any other injury to the body? Um, And the challenge, I suppose, with postpartum is the lack of evidence, which is really difficult for evidence-based practitioners because there just isn't much evidence out there about, for example, cesarean section rehab. What we have got, though, is loads of evidence about wound rehab and muscle injury rehab, especially in footballers because they've got there's lots of money invested in that field. So if we look at if we look at a football injury that actually is about thirty centimeters. Well, that's about the same as a cesarean section injury. So actually, how can we use some of those protocols for women? And and ultimately, as long as we're not doing any harm, we're only going to help. So I um, 
yeah, I, I see women privately postnatally for what we call mummy MATs, that, that full postnatal checkup. And the amount of injuries that women are living with, we know that half the postnatal population are, are living with a pelvic organ prolapse. Like, how's that okay? How are we, how are we allowing that to be normalized? So it is a mission of mine and it's a challenge, but it, it's happening elsewhere. So in France, for example, um, women have about 10 um, postnatal appointments with a physio um, oh, postnatally wow. as part of their routine care. So that's just routine. Um, we're a while off that. But if we can at least be picking up women with symptoms that have had significant tears that have got, we know have got um, symptoms of a pelvic floor dysfunction, we can at least start having these conversations. And at the moment, women are just living with symptoms and not talking about it because they're embarrassed. And we see on telly that you just put a tenor lady on. So we just get on with it. And that shouldn't be the way it is. And you said at the start there, there's a lack of evidence. Is that just due to the fact that no one's actually explored it or in invested money in, in funding that research? Yeah, exactly. That okay. just hasn't happened. And, and research is always difficult, especially in pregnancy. Research is really difficult. And that's why recently, I think it's been like the first ever um, study done on high intensity exercise in pregnancy, which is nuts, isn't it? Like, how are we only just discussing this now? But it's the first ever one because of the ethics around testing on pregnant women. It's obviously just so difficult. Um, but but postnatally, I think there's definitely stuff we can start we can start doing, and, and we need to start having these conversations. And I think we are. I think we are starting to have these conversations um, that will lift the lid. And and the more women demand it, ask for it raise these questions, talk about their symptoms, the more things will have to change. Yeah, I think we're living in a world now, aren't we, where as if we've got all these amazing people dotted around like yourself that want to actually drive something forward. We have got the platform to, you know, make change and to actually gather the statistics that actually women are suffering with this and change needs to happen. Definitely. And I think women, I think women's voices are getting louder in this area as well. You know, if I, yeah. if we think now we're, we're actually talking about periods now, which is amazing. We never used to talk about periods. That was like a complete taboo. Whereas now women are getting more comfortable. And I, I did a poll um, recently because I really recognize in my line of work that talking about periods, vaginas, sex, childbirth is like, just my first language it's completely yeah. normal like nothing makes me blush but but actually for a lot of women talking about leaking urine or you know an issue with their vagina is you know mortifying and so I did I did a poll on Instagram about um how how people felt about talking about these these things or even saying the word and actually a lot of people are still really embarrassed about it and I find it really taboo which which I found interesting i thought it'd be the other way but i recognize the people i speak to and talk to and, and my line of work it, it is really normalized for us but we've still got a big way to go i think in terms of society and culture yeah and i guess platforms like yours if, if you maybe dip into the comments maybe women and parents are comfortable sharing that in the comments and you know you've mm. got private facebook groups and things like that but yeah i guess that stems from things like mental health issues we need to encourage people to get more comfortable talking about those and things like that so yeah really interested to see how that pans out for you anyway yeah I know fingers crossed and I think mental health is really interesting so I do think we we've still got a long way to go don't get me wrong yeah but I think actually we have got a lot better at talking about mental health issues and I hope that female pelvic health is something that will follow on because actually they're so interlinked women that have got pelvic health dysfunction are way more likely to have mental health issues um and that has an impact on marriages it has an impact on on so much so they are actually quite interlinked so I think that I hope that the conversations will kind of follow in the footsteps of mental health conversations yeah and hopefully certainly on the nhs there's a level of consistency because we struggle so we live in south wales and we struggle with mental health support on the nhs after laura gave birth to noah because it was at 20 weeks um mm. we were literally just given a leaflet and within our health board there was no mental health support because Gosh. it wasn't 24 weeks noah was classed as a miscarriage um how or i mean that's it's so awful isn't it it's yeah so i know awful. so laura's basically told you've had a miscarriage obviously we spent the night with noah but you've had a miscarriage here's a leaflet if you want support there's no mm. support within our health board but fortunately laura's got a few midwife friends who help direct finding the support she needs but yeah to think that women are going through that every day in south wales and getting no support for it is quite frightening to be fair 
it's terrifying and that's something you carry with you for forever you know yeah and the same way we talked about how you feel when you give birth to a live child and hopefully a positive experience you carry that forever but you do if it's a negative one as well especially yeah. in the circumstance of loss and I think there's something we quite often talk about actually um professionally is there's a real gap in care for for babies in in similar gestations to your little little boy Noah there's a real gap in that care because you don't fit in. You don't absolutely don't fit in the same category as a as an early loss or a miscarriage because it's a, a twenty week baby. You know, you have you have built your life with that child, haven't you? By twenty weeks, you you know you're very set up for that experience. And and but but you've not got a live birth, and there really is this gap. It feels like you don't fit in either of the services that are currently available. I I always feel anyway when I support parents that go through that. And in terms of the body as well, I remember we had to go back to the hospital, I think, two or three times because Laura's having Sophia bleeding a, a week after giving birth. And it's like the body still felt... It's given birth. It, it was pregnant or it was mm. given birth. Yeah, so... Mm. Yeah, there, there was just no support, really, which, mm. was, which was pretty shocking. And, um, yeah, we've spoken to, um, I think, the head of Midwifery, midwifery at the hospital we were at who came out to our house um which was nice to, to give some feedback because a, a few other things went wrong um after Noah was born but yeah it's um a lot of work to do but like I said there, there are lots of amazing people within the NHS it's just certain ways of working um and certain resources need to be funded a bit better I think yeah definitely and I think often it does just come comes down to that system and yeah unless people can bravely speak out like you and Laura obviously did after your experience, things don't change because the the voices of parents are so much more powerful than the voices of the likes of me saying, we should do this, we should do that. It's it's the voices of those people that have really lived that that are a million times more powerful in implementing change. But it's but it's brave to to step out and say, actually, this happened, this needs improving. We deserve better. Other parents deserve better. That can be a really challenging conversation to have, but it, it is a really important one. Yeah. And, and to be fair, the support with Mia's pregnancy was amazing. So when we provided that feedback to the head of Miv, Midwifery that came out to our house, when we had the 12-week scan with Mia, um, she was actually there with us in the scan, in, in the scan oh, room, um, which was lovely. Yeah. So, yeah, really nice. One thing I wanted to talk about, because it came up uh, on the question box quite a lot um, when I put out a question before you came on, mm. was breastfeeding rates in the UK in terms of we've got um, some of the lowest breastfeeding rates in the world in the UK and parents were interested to see from someone that works um, in midwifery can you put your finger on why that is? I know certainly when you look at the data, in terms of women choosing to breastfeed initially, I think is around 70 to 80%. Ah, yeah. But then that falls down to 1% at around six months. So um, mm. from our point of view, Laura breastfed Luca for three years and she's seven months in with Mia. Obviously, it's a very bumpy road, but I wondered if you had any insights into why you think the UK has some of the lowest breastfeeding rates? Yeah. Oh, this is such a great question, Tom. I'm pleased that this was noted, actually, because I think this completely plays into the conversation that we've just had about support. Um, yeah. With the fact that we know that it's something like 70%, isn't it, I think, that, that women initiate breastfeeding, that shows us that a lot, over half our population wants to breastfeed their baby, which is amazing. And we know there are so many benefits to mums and babies, health outcomes, short term and long term. So that's awesome. It also shows us that we've been really great at all the, all the money that's gone into telling people how great breastfeeding is. You know, I, I'd be surprised now if I saw anybody whether they'd had children, haven't had children that didn't know there were health benefits of breastfeeding. You know, I feel like that's a real wide yeah. message. So we've done a great job at that. What we have catastrophically failed to do is to then support those women and those families that want to breastfeed. So there's so much out there saying, yeah, breastfeed, it's great. It's good for you and your baby. And then you have your baby and you're discharged from hospital after a few hours and, and you are really struggling to get access to feeding support. I think that's where the issue lies. Right. And I speak to women all the time that are having, you know, having issues, needing support, and it's kind of where do you access that? So I always really encourage women, 
in pregnancy to have like a list on your fridge of the National Breastfeeding Helplines number, your local breastfeeding support groups, that friend, you know, that family friend, everyone that's breastfed, and I'm sure Laura's probably done this with people, Tom, is you love supporting other women that are struggling because you yeah. realise how tough it is. So, you know, that that great aunt, whoever, that breastfed, you know, her children until they went to school, whoever those, those, you know, role models for breastfeeding in your life are, have their numbers because they'll get it. Because yes, breastfeeding is amazing, but it's blooming tough. It's mm. really, really tough. And I remember saying to my husband at one point, if I wasn't a midwife and I didn't know this was normal, and there's no way I would have carried on. Because even, I, I come from a bottle feeding family. My husband comes from a breastfeeding family. So for him, he's okay. got two younger siblings. It was like, it wasn't even a question. He just breastfeed, like that's just normal. Whereas for my family, my dad was mortified, absolutely mortified. <laughs> I was breastfeeding, like it's such a contrast. Oh, and wow. my mum was saying, you know, you shouldn't breastfeed that much. He's obviously starving. You need to give him a bottle. <laughs> and they were my, you know, they were my influences. You know, I've got a well-educated family. They were, they were my influences. And I just think, wow, if that's what women have got, and they haven't got that prior knowledge or those other support resources, you know, what What on earth are we meant to do? There's no wonder our breastfeeding rates drop off. Um, and I, I think when I, when I speak to women in practice, often it's that, that kind of day two or three. So always, I say day, it's always nighttime, which is brutal, where babies start cluster feeding before your milk comes in. And so commonly, that's when families, women, mums, dads will say to me, you know, I'm obviously not producing enough milk or they're obviously hungry. So I've given them a formula top up and I'm not anti-formula at all. That's absolutely fine. But if your plan is to breastfeed, actually what we then do is prevent your milk coming in. We impact yeah. your milk supply. The cluster feeding then gets more because your baby's like, I need that milk to come in. Whereas when we understand that that's a completely normal, completely normal physiological thing to happen, then women are like, oh, okay, yeah, this is going to be a really tough 24 hours, but it's normal. And when women know it's normal, that's when it that's when it changes the game. So if you'd popped along to that breastfeeding support cafe and 10 other mums had gone, oh yeah, we were up all night as well. We saw every hour in. They're constantly feeding, you know. That they you get that 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 community, that camaraderie, that reassurance. It changes the game. So have that list on your fridge. Those people you're gonna call, that other breastfeeding mum, that local support group, that national health line so that you can get that support in because I don't I don't think we can breastfeed alone I think we need a support I think it takes an army even just that person saying you're doing a great job or making you a, a drink because it's thirsty work and making sure you're fueled and and all of that practical stuff as well it really does take support and I think that's where we lack yeah I think going way back now so a week into breastfeeding Luca um Laura was quite low because there were so many unknowns. She hadn't really had that experience of breastfeeding. I think Luca was cluster feeding at the time and mm -hmm. someone put her in touch with a breastfeeding support worker. I think it was a Sunday and Laura messaged her on um, Facebook. This woman's got th three kids and she literally came straight round on a Sunday off her own back, gave Laura two hours of her time and that and those two hours unlocked like the next three years. Obviously, there were yeah. ups and downs, but the next three years of breastfeeding. And it's that level of support that you need, really, isn't it? Because Amazing. there are so many unknowns and they're, like there's, it's quite a bumpy road breastfeeding, certainly when they're just always on the boob and you don't know yeah. why. <laughs> yeah, always, um, always. That, yeah, w without that support, there's plenty of opportunities just to think right maybe this isn't for me when that might yeah. be the case but you know with that extra support it might turn out that actually you know it, it is working for you definitely i always say to parents tom never never stop your breastfeeding journey on a bad day so if you've decided yeah. that you know you want to stop breastfeeding do it on a day that's gone really well baby said well you're feeling good because then you know you've made the right choice for you whereas if you stop it when it's 2am and you're tired and frustrated you really might live to regret that and that's not ever what we want for parents so if you're going to stop great that's fine if you've made that choice but stop it on a good day not in that really difficult time get that yeah. support instead it's, it's invaluable I remember um, me and my husband were laughing at this the other day because we've had a friend that's recently had a baby and we're talking about how you know breastfeeding babies just seem to breastfeed 24 7 um, <laughs> and we were we were saying we remember how our little boy would have would literally breastfeed every 45 minutes so in the morning I couldn't have a bre have breakfast and get showered and dry my hair 
before he needed another feed. So there, there's, there's times where I'd be drying my hair and my husband would be holding him on the boob so that he could breastfeed and I could get ready before he had to go to work. Like, it's just insane, the stuff you do. And that's yeah. why we need that support and to normalise, I think, normalise the realities. Well, Laura's having her hair done tomorrow, which is quite a prolonged process. So we've already booked in me <laughs> popping into the salon to put Nia on the boob and then go for lunch. <laughs> isn't it I remember taking my little boy when he was really new to a salon because that was easy because he just okay. fed and slept um but yeah then as they get older it's it's a, it's a logistical nightmare isn't it <laughs> yeah um one thing we're learning well Laura's learning with Mia because when Mia was born Laura's frame of reference was breastfeeding like a two and a half year old but obviously it's a completely different ball game resetting back to the newborn days and yeah with Luca the the boob sort of saved all. It was obviously for feeding, but it was also just to soothe him and to calm him down when he was a little bit upset. But with Mia, it's much more functional, efficient. She just wants to go on the boob, feed off. So it's, it's I think Laura's at the moment readjusting those expectations that breastfeeding two babies is, could be two completely different journeys. Yeah, that's so true, isn't it? The needs of a newborn breastfeeding compared to, you know, a two, one, you know, even a one-year-old really, where 18 month old, depending on how weaning's gone, two-year-old, it's, it's completely different because it becomes less about nutrition, sometimes a bit about nutrition, a bit about thirst, but primarily it becomes about comfort and regulation of emotions and sleep and, and hormonal things and or when they're poorly, perhaps, immune responses. It really does shift from survival, which, you know, for, for a newborn, it is survival, isn't it? It's, you know, it's calories, it's energy, it's nutrition, it's it's fluid, it's fat, it's all that stuff that they literally need to survive and function, whereas it does shift drastically as, as into an older child. And I don't know how, how you guys have, have found uh, breastfeeding, Tom, but I certainly found when I was um, breastfeeding a small baby... Um, it was really seemed really actually accepted publicly, um, which I was surprised about. I, I genuinely always felt like it was a really positive thing, and I never okay. felt looked at or judged. And, and I kind of thought I might do a little bit um, from kind of what you hear, but I breastfed him everywhere, and it always seemed fine. Um, and then as he got bigger and older, mm. I did really feel a shift. Um, and I wonder if that's something that that you guys have experienced because I. I, I but Finley stopped feeding. He kind of self-weaned, to be honest, at about 17 months. So we just followed his lead. Um, but I definitely felt once he was, he was a big boy anyway. So at one, he kind of looked to. And I definitely found that as we got later into our journey, I definitely noticed some kind of looks and, and shocks or surprises that I didn't notice when he was little. Yeah, I think, I think as they get older, the public feeding becomes less frequent just because they feed less. But yeah, yeah if, it, if it is necessary, you definitely get those, certainly when you've got a toddler that can walk, just those that sort yeah. of eye rolls or, or even just intrigue, just because you don't see it in this country, yeah. do you? You don't see a mum no. putting an 18 month old on the boob. Um, yeah, it's true. You know, I'm sure people think, why would why would you put the baby on the boob when you can, they can eat and drink for themselves? But there's a lot more to it than just the nutrition, isn't there? If it soothes Absolutely. the little one, then it soothes the little one. You're going to do it. Yeah. But yeah, the judgment definitely comes when they find their feet, um, mm. for sure. Yeah, I, I def definitely felt that first. And actually, you know, the World Health Organization suggests breastfeeding until two and beyond doesn't it so if yeah. we're looking at national guidance it's age two um yeah. i was actually a bit sad when we didn't make it to two that was my aim my aim initially was six weeks <laughs> then it was okay. six months <laughs> then it was a year and then i was like oh i'd quite like to get to two but um our little boy just had other plans so we, we yeah. rolled with his lead and that's that's also different aren't they that's the other thing they're all so different that's it i think luca self weaned at about two and a half to three but talking to Laura about it and she said it's quite emotional because thinking back when they south wean you sort of don't know when that last feed is going to come like Laura can't put a finger on that last feed um so she yeah. says she wants to try and be able to identify when that last feed was with um with Mia so yeah definitely I remember um I do remember the last feed but it was a night that for some reason my husband was out and he was just really unsettled and wouldn't go to sleep so I put him on the boob and he went to sleep but I um 
I didn't know it was going to be our last seed. So that's that's what got me. It was like, oh, I didn't, okay. I didn't, I didn't treasure it. I was like, why aren't you going to sleep? Come on, like get to sleep. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, oh, this is this is a lovely last feed. It was like, come on, hurry up and go to <laughs> go to sleep. And yeah. then that was our last one. Uh, but it's yeah, be careful what you wish for, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've I, I haven't even made it through half my notes, so we'll definitely oh, be sorry. jumping on um, I another do talk podcast. A lot, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Another podcast again soon. But um, what I wanted to do is to, to to close out. Are we able to just cover three quick fire questions mm. um, and just say what comes to your head? Of course. Um, yeah. So question one is knowing what you know now, what parenting advice would you give yourself before you became a parent? Mm. Don't, don't try and compare yourself to anybody else. Oh, that's a great thing. one, yeah. There's so much comparison out there and it really is a thief of joy. Yeah. Yeah, I think parents do need to do what works for them and their families, isn't it? Um, 100%, yeah. And it, it's more common in those newborn days where people are constantly comparing those small little milestones. So yeah, that's a really good one. Um, what's the one thing you feel you need to work on as a parent? Being more patient. I like to see things 100 miles an hour and toddlers <laughs> don't do things 100 miles an hour. They do it at minus 100 miles. So definitely being more patient. Yeah. Yeah. Giving them more time to do things is definitely a, a yeah. good tip. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's the best thing for you personally about being a parent? Oh, it's, I think it's watching the world through the eyes of your child. There is no magic like it. You know, yeah. you've just been on holiday and watching every new thing they see and that complete joy in the simplest of things, I think teaches us so much as adults. It teaches us to be present, to really embrace the small things, those things that actually matter. Um, in, the, in the rush of the day to day, that's really easy to forget. So yeah, watch, watching the world through the eyes of that child that you, that you love so much. Yeah, yeah, because you're going through the toddler years at the moment, aren't you? So they're they're, they're yeah. definitely very special between like one and four, where mm -hmm. all they want to do is explore and charge around everywhere and get curious and be involved in everything. Um, yeah, everything's fun. Everything's yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for joining me today, Pip. I'm definitely going to get you back because I've got a whole host <laughs> of uh, other questions. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, it's been really nice to chat and I can't wait to get this conversation out there because there's a lot of um, value for parent parental support in there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. It's been great to chat. Thanks for having me. Cool. Cheers, Pip. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>